Good morning. Welcome to Booktube with on day one. I saw the first video challenge video go up last night and it was um, to recreate a book cover in the style of Art Attack. So just taking whatever you have to recreate the cover, to create one big picture, which is definitely such a creative challenge, but also like hella extra. So I'm just gonna be looking for a book to recreate right now. Hello. It is now, I think, where's my phone? It is now, I think, almost 8 o'clock. Time got away from me a little bit there. Yeah, I've only read the first story um, in The Ladies of Grace of Jew and half of the second one. So that is not very good. I'm going to try to catch up. I just got home from work, just had some dinner. Uh, I'm going to try to catch up now, but I'm going to do the... Uh, video challenge for today first. You get five minutes. I think those are the rules. Oh, and you can gather the materials and choose the cover ahead of time. So I'll show you what I have right now. And the book I've picked is I Capture the Castle by Dodie Smith. And I picked it because it's a little more simple, a little easier to recreate, but it's also quite stunning. It's a beautiful cover. And these are the materials. I got clothes in the colors of the cover so I'm gonna time myself and we'll see if I can do it Ooh. timer starts now Okay, I'm done. Oh god, doesn't look like it at all. <laughs> so, this is what the cover looks like. And this is my interpretation. Cue detail shots. It looks like a pile of laundry. We'll just say that nobody understands my vision and I'm just a misunderstood artist, okay? I finished the second story, uh, what was it called again? On Licorice Hill. It was a retelling of Rumpelstiltskin, but in a kind of more feminist way. Her first book, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, is about two men, and there's barely any women in it. There's two main uh, female characters, I think. Yeah, two main female characters, but they're, how they're portrayed is more realistic, as in as in they were more like thought of as the wives. Um, they couldn't practice magic if, not that they wanted to, but if they did want to, they couldn't really practice it because it was kind of frowned upon for a woman, right? Uh, in those times, it's set like around the Napoleonic Wars. So it's quite a long time ago. Um, so it is more realistic in that sense, but then it's feminist because it points out why they couldn't do those things and it shows the women in a three-dimensional way rather than like side characters just running the men's houses and um i don't know cleaning up after them only worrying about domestic things and stuff like that um it does show those things but i feel like it gives them a roundness to the character that shows that yes that was their life they were in the domestic sphere that was just how it was but they're interesting characters in their own right if that makes sense i think the number one thing is to show what the character is thinking that they're three-dimensional that they're thinking crit somewhat critically and questioning everything around them um, that they have a voice 
basically. So even if physically what is happening to them is typical of the time, i.e. they can't like be magicians, uh, even if they wanted to because they're women, mentally they're just as active as the men uh, who are allowed to be whatever they want to be. So this book is really interesting because it shows how women, not the woman in the other book, but just like different women from different places have managed to find magic on their own because it just comes naturally to them and manage to make magic and um, how they've managed to get around all the rules of life. Not just when it comes to magic, but also when it comes to, you know, um, how they live, who they marry, how they conduct their lives. So the first story, the title story, The Ladies of Grace of Jew, is actually quite horrifying if you think about it. I can't say anymore because it will be a spoiler, but it's quite gruesome. Yeah, I would say they definitely um, misuse whatever magic they have, but it's quite a brutal consequence if they don't. So it's the lesser of two evils in a way, and I really like that juxtaposition of kind of the refinement of society and, and women's society in particular because it's um it's about a group of three ladies who on the surface look very very respectable but what they do in the background is it is black magic i would say it is quite dark but yeah so that one's my favorite of the two that i've read so far on licorice hill it's okay it's it's interesting so I still do like it I just I don't know I'm not one to read like fairy tales that are written old style there's just something that's not super interesting about them for me I don't know why I have a book of fairy tales that are written like how they would have been said years ago because you know like it was an oral tradition I, I don't know if I will ever read it. I've tried and tried to read it a lot of times and I just, I don't like the style. It's like very simplistic and it's just like. The illustrations in this book are great. Can you see it? I wish the other book had these as well. So I finished the next two stories, Mrs. Mab and The Duke of Wellington Misplaces His Horse. I really liked Mrs. Mab a lot. It's about two people under enchantment and the way that... What is her name? I always want to say Collins. The way that Clark um, describes the enchantment is just great. She never tells you too much. She almost just gives you like little nuggets of information and from that you're able to put the pieces together and it's the nature of the magic in this world is not definite at all it can take any shape or form um you're never quite sure exactly what it looks like there's no hard and fast rules so it can look like many things all at once to different people and i just i just love it because she'll like she'll tell you little things um, and they're all contradictory, but they all serve to create one big picture that is very magical and great. So I really like that. And the nature of the enchantment that she describes in this one is similar to um, what happens to Lady Pole in Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. So that was really cool to see as well. The Duke of Wellington misplaces his horse was great too. Uh, it was really cool to see him again. It feels like needing an old friend because he is everywhere in the previous book and even in this book they talk about him like he's some sort of god so it's just like you feel very familiar to him and he's revered so it was really cool to see him in a predicament almost and he had to like find his way out of it in the introduction of this book and also in the first book there's quite a lot of stories featuring the raven king um having to do demeaning work or having to be in a scrape and he'll have to figure out a way out of it and that's what it reminded me of seeing a great figure um, kind of down on his luck like a normal person and having to 
and not having any weapons or anything at his disposal and just having to use his wits to get out of it. So that was really cool. Uh, right now I'm in the middle of Mr. Simonelli or the Fairy Widower. About halfway through the book. It takes me quite a while to get into a book and the beginning stages is always quite a slog because I don't know what it is. It, I find it hard to um, get into the book and like get used to the way things are in the story. Especially because this is a book of short stories so you're constantly being plucked out of the world and like put back in again but the fact that they all they're all kind of set in the same world definitely helps so I really like that. Hello check in it's almost midnight so I'm gonna stop reading here and start editing which will be interesting but we'll try um, to get it uploaded by tomorrow so I finished what do I finished I finished the next story which is uh, Mr. Simonelli or the Fairy Widower. That's what it's called. There were some interesting features of the magic such as um, at one point one character uh, she's under a spell. This isn't a spoiler. Not really. So whatever she sees is bewitched. She thinks it's it, everything's like super sumptuous and rich and vibrant and beautiful but the spell wears away on the other eye so it ends up being um, on one eye everything looks great and on the other eye she sees it for what it actually is which is um, decrepit and disgusting and dirty so it's really cool she's like going like this so it was a really cool visual to like imagine her going down the corridor um, and having two different visions of the house that she was in and also remembering that she used to be so happy with where she was and now she's horrified to be where she is. So it was just, it was a really cool juxtaposition. That was the most of what I remembered. Uh, most of it was okay. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, but that, that story was also pretty long. So now it's put me to three quarters of the way through the book. So I might possibly be able to finish it after I'm done editing. I'm not sure though. But um, if I do finish it, then I'll put that in the next vlog since it is past midnight now so hello and welcome to day two it is actually 7 p.m. right now I time just I just lost track of time and I had some stuff to do I read a little bit I finished one story it was called Tom Brightwind and it was good it was okay not one of my favorites um, but it was interesting because it features uh, an unlikely best friend duo, so it has a fairy and a human, which I never thought would be possible. I always thought their relationships were more of a master-servant kind of situation, but these two guys seem to hold each other as equals, which is really interesting because they're so different, and it, they never show us how their friendship grew and also what sort of things they do together to make them so close anyway because like when I saw them when I was reading the story they were arguing most of the time so that was kind of interesting so it was just interesting um, seeing kind of an unusual relationship and getting another glimpse into the fairy world because I feel like we only got a taste of it in the Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell book I really want to see more I feel like she's going to write a part two I'm not sure I should really look that up but yeah, I've only read one story. That's all I've done today. And then I had to go to work and now I'm back. Um, but I can't read just yet because we're gonna go to dinner for my sister's birthday. Also, I'm not sure that the daily, ah, my arm's getting tired. I'm not sure that the daily vlogging is gonna work out for me because I'm just starting out and it's taking me so long to edit everything, especially because like I wanna make it pretty and stuff. Um, so I might put the vlogs together in the end. I'm not sure. That might be good, just putting them all together into one long thing. Possibly, possibly. Hi, welcome to day three of Booktubeathon. It's not going super well, or 
I don't know. I guess it depends on how you look at it. I still think it's a success, personally. Not in the sense of me um, reading as much as I had originally planned to, but it's still a success in general because I don't normally read every day and yesterday I still managed to read one story and it was a pretty long story. So it's okay. It's okay, friend. It's okay. It's fine. Good job, Isabel. Good job. So I finished the last two stories of the Ladies of Grace of Jew. I really liked both of them actually. The first one was about Mary Queen of Scots and her plotting against Queen Elizabeth and she does this through embroidery. And I really love how embroidery was included in Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell so it was great to see it here as well. How you can use it to depict scenes and like trap people in them and stuff like that. Make things happen to them through a visual representation. I guess you can do that with art as well but there's something cool about stitching it yourself stitch by stitch it all comes together maybe because i used to sew and study fashion design maybe i have like a a personal connection to it i don't know it, there's just something really cool about it and it feels a lot more visceral um than art like painting for example embroidery was also included in the story of the duke of wellington so that was really cool to see there i would be interested in reading other fantasy stories to do with embroidery. And then the second, or the very last, anyway, one is about John Usglass or the Raven King and how he gets um, thwarted by a lowly charcoal bone. How he gets thwarted by a lowly charcoal bone. <laughs> it's so hard to say that. The last, the last story is about John Usglass or the Raven King and how he gets thwarted by a lowly charcoal burner. Oh, that was so hard to say. Um, that was a really interesting story as well. I I liked the story about embroidery better, but the last one was really fun too because there's different magics that are happening in the story, but at one point um, all these animals are talking and all his dogs are telling him how disappointed they were in him. It was just, it made me laugh out loud. That part was really funny. Let's see if I can find it. I'll read it aloud. I found it. Um, he hurried away to the rose garden to escape the horse and the cow, but the roses turned their red and white faces towards him and spoke at length about his duty to the poor, and some of the more ill-natured flowers hissed, thief, thief. He shut his eyes and put his fingers in his ears, but his dogs came and found him and pushed their noses in his face and told him how very, very disappointed they were in him. <laughs> A lot of this made me laugh out loud, but um, yeah, I finished it, yay! I'm so happy. I really like this. I would give it a four stars. I um I want to get my own copy. I own the Jonathan Strange and Miss Norrell, so I want to get this one too. And I really, really hope that she's writing another book in this series because I've just gotten so attached to the world. It was hard to get into at first because the first book, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, that's such a mouthful to say every time, by the way, um, but anyway, the first book was so long, it's a thousand pages, and it's so hard to get into, for me, personally, I think, um, but it was so good in the end, and I really like it, and I'm watching the show right now. I'm watching the show right now, and just seeing the characters and the events brought to life just makes, just, like, endears it to me even more, so, uh... And she creates such a full picture of the world with all of her footnotes and even with this, like, it just rounds out the world so well. And the fact that she sets it within English history, so it's filled with events that all of us know. Or, if we don't know it, then uh, we've heard of it anyway, and we can easily look it up. So she sets it in a world that we know so well, or we're familiar with. But then she adds uh, elements of her own. It's like equal parts familiar and strange. And it's just 
it's when she does change something up, you're like delighted to to realize it because. I don't know. It's just a different version. It's just really cool. I love this world so much. But yeah, I'm glad to have finished this. Again, this is my second time reading it. I've read it before. Actually, I realized that all the books that I've picked for this reading challenge are rereads besides Public Library. So uh, that is not very good. <laughs> um, oh, The End of Green Gables graphic novel isn't a reread. I haven't read that one before. But I have read Anne of Green Gables before multiple times. It's one of my favorite books. So I really, after this readathon, I really need to push myself to read newer books because I'm just like in the cycle of reading the things that I know already. And it's very comforting, but should try new things once in a while, you know? Mm -hmm.